Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel where we talk about Hungarian true crime cases and my name is Tima. Today I am going to share with you the story of a train derailment. We are going to try to uncover the facts, the theories and the possibility of a governmental conspiracy. On the 13th of September 1931, at around 11 p.m., an international train left the Keleti railway station in Budapest. It was a scheduled train and it usually carried 12 wagons and on normal occasions over 200 passengers. However, this time it carried only 105 passengers plus the crew. It was heading to Vienna and it was going to stop over in a town called Biatorbágy, where there is a viaduct that connects two hills together so that the train doesn't have to go around any of those hills. It took until 30 minutes past midnight for the train to arrive in Biatorbágy and as it was crossing over the viaduct, a huge explosion awakened the city. So the locomotive and the first six wagons fell into a 26 meter deep crevice, killing 22 people and seriously injuring 17 people. In the investigation afterwards, it was uncovered that the explosion was caused by none other than a bomb. This bomb was a very interesting one because its main explosive was acrosite. And acrosite was usually used in the Austrian army for fire guns. And this bomb was strategically placed in a section of the tracks where a guide rail was not installed. A guide rail is just a secondary, smaller rail that prevents the railings of the train. So it looked like whoever made the bomb and placed it there was an expert in explosives and had an extensive knowledge about the railway system as well. The bomb was created in a way that it would be activated by the weight of the train crossing over it. And it detonated just when the sixth and the seventh wagon was directly on top of it. The locomotive fell into the deep, pulling with it the first six wagons, though the other six wagons detached and they stayed on the rails untouched, at least saving those passengers. At the time of the explosion, the train was going with about 69 km per hour, but because of the power and the force of the detonation, the train accelerated to over 102 km per hour, so it fell into this deep crevice with a huge crash that was devastating. And the driver's body was found in the wrecks and his hand was still clutching tightly onto the brake handle because this man died trying to stop the train. Even though he tried his best to stop the train, it was not enough to prevent the tragedy. A human's reaction time is too long and by the time the driver noticed the detonation, it was too late. Not to mention that the brake distance and the time for the brake to activate was going to take way too long. And when the explosion happened, a seven meter long piece of the rail exploded and fell out of the tracks. So there was no way about it. The train was going to fall down. The first responders was the local police, but the investigation was conducted by the Hungarian Royal State Police. The detectives found the remains of the bomb, but not only that, they also uncovered a letter that was taped onto a nearby column. And this letter was going to steer this investigation into a very interesting direction. Because this letter was going to push all of the suspicion onto the communist. Well, first of all, the letter read, and I quote, Workers, you do not have any rights. We are going to force the capitalist to give you rights. You will hear from us every month because we are everywhere. If there are no job opportunities, we will create them. The capitalists will pay for it all. Don't worry, you will never run out of petrol." End quote. And it was signed off as the translator. So you can see how whoever left this letter was apparently a communist who really hated the capitalists. And it was a threat that further terrorist acts were going to take place every single month. 
Therefore, the investigation was going to be into a mysterious communist terrorist who was against the government. There were a few suspects, but eventually it turned out to be baseless and there was no real evidence against any of those suspects. Now I have to explain you some of the Hungarian history at this time. I'm going to keep it easy and short, it's not going to go too much in depth, just as much as you need to know to be able to understand the events of this case. As I have mentioned before in a previous video, after the First World War, Hungary ceased to be a monarchy with Austria and it formed its own sovereign kingdom. Though we did not have a king, we had a prime minister and we had a governor, but no king. Obviously, a lot of people really did not like this political situation. Most people either wanted to still be in the monarchy with Austria or they wanted to become a democratic state. But what was the point in being a kingdom without having a king? Extremist political ideas were on the rise and this is how this illegal underground communist party or community was formed as well. But this tension and terrible situation was amplified by the Great Depression that started in 1929 and it really took about two years for it to really hit Hungary and the economy was not going very well. Strikes were an everyday thing, people were angry and pissed all the time. Therefore, the Hungarian government had a very good reason to believe that this train derailment was indeed caused by the communists trying to overthrow the current prime minister and the governor. So on the 14th of September, the then governor, a man named Horti Miklós, called together his little committee and group of advisors to come up with a reaction plan on what to do in this situation. Two very important people were part of his advisor's team. The minister of interior was a man named Kerestes Fischer Ferenc and the Minister of Defense was a man named Gömbös Gyula. Seems familiar? So these two and some more people helped the governor come to the conclusion that the government had to issue a state emergency and a statarium until the terrorists or terrorists were captured. And it didn't take very long for the perpetrator to be found, though it was not because of the good investigative work. It was that the terrorist gave himself up. It happened on the 7th of October, so less than a month later, that a man named Matushka Silvester went to the Austrian police and gave himself up, admitting to not one, not two, but three train derailments that he had committed in a year prior. One in Austria, one in present-day Germany, and one in Hungary, the one that the Hungarian police was also investigating. He insisted that he acted alone and he was able to orchestrate these three train derailments without having been caught. Like the only reason he was caught was because he decided to give himself up. He also claimed that he was insane and that he heard voices in his head. There was a voice specifically named Lao and because of the encouragement of this voice in his head, he was able to commit these terrible crimes. And Matushka Silvester's name was not new to the police at all. Matushka is his family name and Silvester is his given name. He claimed himself to be a survivor though when the police investigated him and everyone else, it was soon realized that his name was not on the passenger's list. And he like dirtied his face and caused himself like superficial injuries to make it look like he was in the train crash. But interestingly, he was not rescued from the train wrecks and he was also not in the other six wagons that were left intact on the rails. Not to mention that he was first sighted, like he first appeared on the scene out of nowhere, like he just popped up somewhere in the hill 
and his first thing to do was to go and touch the remains of the bomb. That was when one of the investigators shouted at him, telling him not to stop it because it could detonate twice. And what Matushka said was that, no, it won't, it can't. So we have this man who says that he is a survivor, though he is not on the passengers list. He was not in the wrecks, he was not in the remaining wagons, he just pops up and he interestingly knows that the bomb was not going to detonate twice. Looks suspicious. But okay, who was Matushka Sylvester anyway? He was born in the town of Chantaver on the 29th of January 1892. His father really wanted him to continue the family legacy and become a shoemaker, though he had different plans for himself. He fought in the First World War and he was in the private first class, but then he got injured. After that, he continued his services as commander in the machine gun squad on the Russian battlefield. After the First World War, he returned back to his hometown and he became a teacher of some sort. But he realized that because of the economic chaos that was caused by the First World War, there was a huge business opportunity for him to become a mule. Well, not for drugs. He started to smuggle salt, sugar, petrol, matches and other things from the Balkans and he became the sole distributor of these products in Vojvodina. Vojvodina used to be a Hungarian territory that is now present-day Serbia that Hungary lost after the First World War. In 1922 he moved to Budapest and opened a shop and he was a merchant and he dealt with a lot of different kinds of products. He was big in the lumber and the coal business, he was also in the real estate business and he continued his smuggling business from the Balkans. It wasn't until 1928 that he relocated and settled in Vienna, though it was very bad timing, because the next year when the Great Depression happened, his finances were going down and he had to sell all of his real estate and slowly but surely he used up all of his savings. He tried to minimize his losses by committing insurance fraud, though he was also involved in brothels and other illegal businesses. But one thing is for sure, by 1931 he was broke, he had gone completely bankrupt. So as the Hungarian police was still searching for the perpetrator of the train derailment in Biatorbágy, Matushka Sylvester went to the authorities in Vienna and gave himself up. And as I said, he really tried to play this insanity card, like I don't even really understand why he gave himself up, because chances are he would have never been caught if he doesn't go to the authorities willingly. The Austrian court really didn't believe this and they deemed him fit to stand trial. And without any physical evidence other than his confession, the Austrian court sentenced him to six years in prison because they could only sentence him for the single train derailment that he committed in Austria that did not yield any casualties. I find it interesting how that Austrian train derailment still caused the injuries of 108 or 5 people. He only got 6 years in prison for that. The Hungarian police caught wind of the news that this man went, gave himself up, admitted to that train derailment that they were investigating and that he had already been sentenced to 6 years in prison. And the Hungarian court started the trial against him without having any evidence and without having him physically there. And that was because of the Staterium. I have told you a few minutes ago that the government issued a state emergency and a staterium. The Hungarian court sentenced him to death and they really wanted to extradite him. Though there was one little issue, the Austrian law did not allow the death penalty, 
so they were not going to extradite a man to a country where they know he's going to be killed. For them, it was unconstitutional. So the Hungarian court had no other way around it than to reduce his death sentence to life in prison. But then they were still going to have to wait out the end of his six-year prison sentence, which ended in 1938, to actually physically put him in a Hungarian prison. And this is exactly what happened. After his six-year prison sentence ended, he was transferred to a prison in the city of Vác in Hungary, where he was going to stay for the rest of his life. Though he did not. Interestingly, in 1941, he was allowed a 17-day-long vacation. There is no information on where he went or why or how he was allowed, but he was out of prison for two weeks for no particular reason. And he did not even finish his life sentence because in 1944 the Soviet army raided Hungary and they arrived exactly in Vác, where he was also imprisoned. And the arrival of the Soviet army put the city into chaos. And for a couple of hours the entire prison building was left unattended by any of the guards. And therefore a lot of the prisoners took their chance and escaped while no one was watching. So you see, he technically spent only 12 years in prison altogether. His six years in Austria and another six years in Hungary. And nobody knows what happened to him. Nobody knows where he went. He just went off the radar. And there are some gossips in here say that he went back to his hometown, though I think that would be a very risky thing to do. And then some other people said that he eventually met his fate and he was executed or killed in some kind of situation. But nothing is for sure. So it looks like a full circle moment, right? This is where the story should end. We after all have this insane man who had gone bankrupt and had nothing to lose. He had committed, allegedly, two other train derailments and he confessed to it anyway. So he got his rightful punishment that in the end he was able to escape. And I really want to say this is the end of this video, goodbye. But it's not. Because there are a lot of missing pieces in the puzzle. Let's talk about them. First of all, remember that I told you that 7 meter long piece of the rail that exploded and that it just blew off and disappeared? Then there is another source that said it was actually only 4 meters long and it blew off but it was found in a nearby house's garden. But the most interesting version of this information is that the rail just broke. Like there was a crack in it but no piece was missing, it was otherwise intact and it could have been easily welded or fixed. And this information came from the first responder, so who do you believe? And why is this piece of information so different in different sources? To me this looks like something that should be obvious. Furthermore, when Matushka was asked about how he built and operated this bomb, he wasn't really able to give a proper answer. It looked a lot like he didn't know what he was talking about. And yeah, you can say that he lied about it, that he faked not knowing, but why go to the police and willingly give yourself up if then you are going to lie about something like this? Like he might as well have said the truth, you know? Because based on what he said about the bomb, it should have been dysfunctional. He did not know how the bomb was built. Not to mention that this bomb was actually super elaborate. It was made up of 12 metal bars which were filled with the explosives. And each of these metal bars was supposed to weigh 4.6 kilograms. And altogether, this bomb weighed 170 kilograms. And it was placed very strategically and smartly into this 
section of the tracks where there was no derailment preventing guide rail. But this viaduct was not accessible in any other way than a train. How did this single man carry a 170 kilogram heavy bomb to a scene which is pretty much inaccessible in any way? You know, so even if he carried this in parts, then it would have meant that he would have made this distance several times. And he obviously couldn't have carried it at once all by himself. Nobody carries 170 kilograms and climbs up on this viaduct alone. And when he was asked about it, he was like, uh, I don't know, I'm just like strong. <coughs> The next and very important piece of the puzzle is the train's schedule. Because every single time, this international train was supposed to be preceded by a cargo train. This cargo train would normally leave 20 minutes before the international train. But there was a policy that in the unlikely and rare scenario that the cargo train can only depart later, it would actually be held back to give way to the international train so it wouldn't be stuck behind the cargo train. And this had happened only two times in the year prior. And that night was the third night that it happened in 12 months. It was not in the schedule, it was not the norm, it was a rare occurrence that had this policy. So there are two possibilities. Matushka either had insider information regarding the cargo train's late arrival, and if he was actually intending to target the international train, then he had to have this insider information. Because in a normal situation, if he was targeting the international train, he would have very little time to set up this 170 kilogram heavy bomb in the dark of the night all by himself in a very hardly accessible place. But as we know, that's not what happened that night. We know that the order was the other way around. So it makes me think like, okay, he either had insider information, maybe somebody even orchestrated the cargo train to depart later, or the other possibility is that his intended target was not the international train, but the cargo train. And he in a way got unlucky because he couldn't have known that that was gonna be one of those rare nights where the order was going to be the other way around. Can you follow what I'm trying to say here? And finally, let's talk about the letter, because we haven't mentioned anything about that. So as we know, this letter implied that whoever was behind the derailment was a communist trying to overthrow the capitalist and the government. Though apparently, only apparently, Matushka Sylvester didn't really have any kind of political ties or political relationships. He was not part of any parties and it really didn't seem like a very good motive for him. So even though the police had already sentenced him to death and then to life in prison, other than his confession, there was really nothing that actually apparently tied him to this crime. You see, there are and there were just so many holes in the story that in 1966, the government reassembled a new committee to reinvestigate this mystery. And the conclusion of the investigation that time was that there was no way he actually acted alone. He had to have some kind of accomplices. Not to mention that he actually did seem to have some kind of political ties that was not uncovered at the time of the crime. Matushka used to move in the same circles and had the same friend group when he was still a successful businessman a few years prior with Gumbes Jula. And Gumbes Jula was at the time still only the Minister of Defense. 
though we know that he was already very openly trying to become prime minister and he was working on his campaign and his team and this was his dream. And yes, Gömbös Gyula is the same man that I have mentioned in today's video before. It was the guy who convinced the governor to issue a state emergency and a statarium. And this is also the same guy that I have mentioned in a video in the 1930s murder mystery. And Gömbös Gyula had all the reasons to orchestrate this elaborate plan and cause chaos in the country. He wanted to promote himself from Minister of Defense to Prime Minister and for that he had to take everybody else out of his way. He had to get rid of the current Prime Minister and he also had to get rid of the Governor and everybody who he deemed was not a strong enough politician. He had all the means to do it. He had the means to get someone to create this elaborate bomb. He had someone to put it up on the viaduct. He had the means to alter the train's departure time and therefore make the cargo train go second. He had the ways to write this letter and imply that the communists were doing it despite having any evidence for it. And he had Matushka Silvester, this old friend that he knew from years ago, who was now a nobody, he was a desperate, broke, bankrupt person, had nothing to lose, he was just a pawn in his game to fame. And his plan worked, because as we know, Gömbös Gyula did become prime minister in the September of 1932. And his involvement is further supported by the fact that the emergency state that he got issued did not end with the capture of the perpetrator, as it was originally intended. In fact, the emergency state was not ended until he became prime minister. The country was in this emergency state for a year longer than it was supposed to, so he could keep all of the other politicians weak and reinforce his own position in power so that he could become prime minister. And I swear I did not go on the internet trying to find elaborate schemes and conspiracies in which Gömbös Gyula was involved in. I did not know about his possible involvement until the last page of these sources that I read. It was a shock for me too that within the same month I get to cover two cases where this asshole was involved in. And why does this even matter if he's involved in? Every prime minister, every politician is always corrupt. Well, because he was so corrupt that he radicalized the country to the extremes and pushed Hungary into the Second World War. And I just wonder if he had never become prime minister maybe this country would be a very different place to live now, you know? So there is the end of the story and I think I conveyed all of the facts and the theories pretty well, though obviously you have to have some kind of affinity to politics and history to understand everything. But I still hope that you found it interesting. I still hope that at least the communist terrorist part of it was interesting to you. And today's Hungarian word of the day should be hmm, something harder because in the recent videos I gave you very easy words. So today it's going to be for conspiracy. Listen, it's összeesküvés. Összeesküvés. I think that's good. Soon you're gonna speak fluent Hungarian. And today's engagement question is what is a mystery that gives you sleepless nights? For me it's totally the man in black mystery. You know how every time somebody witnesses an alien and like they go public about it? Somehow two men in black suits are are sighted visiting these people and then those people mysteriously go missing or they have amnesia about what happened to them. To me, it's totally believable. Sometimes I just stay up thinking about it. Do men in black actually exist? 
What is it for you? Let us know down in the comment section as well as everything that you thought about this case. Don't forget to like this video if you have made it this far. It's free for you. It helps me out. Don't forget to subscribe because I swear I can be interesting sometimes. And thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye!